Hey, it's just the Sky Kid and the Knights of the Round Table. Kid <clears throat> points. Beer guy. And on the phone with us this evening, we have the horn section, basically, from the pandemics, parentheses, NY Ska. So, hello, guys. Introduce yourselves and what it is that you do in the band. Okay, hi. My name's Chris Malone, and I play trombone, and I sing in the pandemics. Hey, it's Paul Chestnut here. I play alto and tenor sax. James and the big as him slayed full barrel, and I play Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man who will it. <laughs> and I'm Christy Darrow, and I play trumpet. Awesome. Also a puppet. <laughs> Do you guys want to take a minute to um, kind of introduce the rest of the band that couldn't join us and what they play? Who are we missing tonight? Uh, sure, I'll take point on that one. Um, tonight we're missing uh, our rhythm section. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yep. uh, the rhythm section is we have uh, Ryan Yenos on guitar. Vinny Carrillo on bass guitar and Cat Stock on drums. And then there's, if I counted four, are there seven of you total? There are seven. Oh. We were eight for many years, and this last summer, our second trumpet player, another Chris, uh, was called uh, Decided to Part Ways. You know, let the Richards actually came back and sat in for a show we did on Thanksgiving Eve last week. Awesome. So, uh, you'll so always be part of the extended family, but for right now we're rocking it as a separate. There's feedback on somebody's phone. Somebody's well, open, open in something. So tell the listening and watching audience, where are you guys from? Well, uh, for the most part, we're based out of Long Island in Brooklyn. Like uh, myself and James are from uh, from out civilization, yeah. <laughs> and then the rest of the guys are scattered all over Long Island for the most part. I mean, well, I think we're all Long Island natives at this point. You know, we've had a bunch. We've had a bunch of different people in the, in the band over the last uh, eight years, and a few of them were from Westchester. But Long Island's always sort of been where we, you know, considered ourselves from Long Island, New York City. And so. We wanted to know, because um, it got brought up Tuesday, why the parentheses New York Ska? Uh, yeah, who did well, make that uh, Facebook page first? Sorry? Who did make the Facebook page originally? Is that Greg? It might have been Greg. I think it was either me or Greg. Greg is our former bass player, for anyone not in the know. Um, but the, re the main reason for the NY Ska, it's kind of like why... Uh, Spring Hill Jack had to change their name to SHJ USA. Uh, is that there? There are other pandemics out there, and uh, many of them defunct. Unfortunately, Facebook lacks the ability to really discern between the ones that don't exist anymore and us. And we've sort of been chugging along, you know, since 2010. And a lot of the bands out there that have taken that name and they have gotten there uh, a little quicker to the punch uh, have been defunct for a number mm -hmm. of years. But unfortunately, you know. The, age of the internet, nothing ever really goes away forever. So you just have all these derelict band pages out there. <laughs> this is really, some really funny ones out there as well. Like, uh, Paul, you remember, what was that one that was like a, was like a Christian DJ? That was like DJ Pandemic? Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I just remember one that was like a gag band for like a hospital staff, I think. It was like the heavy <laughs> flu in the pandemics. Uh -huh. I thought that was pretty good. When... <laughs> When you kind of look you guys up, like if you just typed in the pandemics, even with the parentheses, you get bands. There's one, I think, from like Sweden, and there's a, one from Boston, too. Huh. The Boston one we get confused with quite a bit, actually. Not, not, not stylistically, but like on things like Spotify, that right. can't tell the difference between two different bands named the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like whenever you pull up our stuff, their stuff also comes up. We've gotten added to shows on like Song Kick or In Your Town like a bunch of times accidentally from them and I'm sure they get the same business from us. <laughs> Maybe it's the universe's way of saying you need to work in collaboration with them to continue to like take over the internet. <laughs> there, there can be only one. That would be a pandemic. 
<laughs> right? That's true. It's all, it like all plays out. Um, so you mm -hmm. formed in 2010. Can you tell us how did you come to be? Well, uh, I guess as, as the, the founding member, uh, that probably should fall to me. Uh, so back in uh, 2010, which in reality is when I first started working on the pandemics as a project in 2007, late 2007, um, I was playing with a band called the Rudy Crew, and uh, one of those guys who mentioned this guy from uh, Baby Love and the Van Dangos, this band from Denmark, that was going to be in New York City, he mentioned he was looking for some people to jam with. So, you know, I figured I'd just throw together a quick jam session with a few of my friends out in Long Island. We took a train out from, from Manhattan because he was here on vacation. And, you know, he brought, brought a few of his friends and just, you know, just a bunch of random people together in the basement and just started playing whatever came, came to everybody, just jamming out. And um, from that jam session, you know, there's a lot of, you know, loose ideas, but the core, one of, one of our uh, first songs actually kind of came out of that jam session, at least in terms of a, melody, a horn, melody, uh, horn line that I came up with, and it just sort of, it started the ball rolling. Um, that song is actually, it's called Brain on Tap, it was the title track of our first full-length record. Mm -hmm. um, and it just sort of picked up from there, I mean, we had a bunch of false starts before we really found a steady crew of guys that we could move forward with. You know, I'm pretty proud to say, up until like last year, we really didn't have that many changes from our original lineup. I think we only changed out two people from between 10, uh, 2010 and 2017. Mm. But for those first years, we were a beat grinder. We had more, uh, we had almost as many ex members going in two years, and our previous band got at 20. Well, that's, that's also something I should point out. James and I used to be in a band together called Spider Nick and the Mad Dogs for a number of years. Probably about, you know, I, I joined the Mad Dogs in 2003, and um, I mean, just things are sort of built upon each other in stages, from like the first lineup, James hung around, and then uh, we brought in Greg, uh, he brought in Ryan, who's a former guitarist, and Paul, and they, they were in a band together called the Haberdashers. Um, That's an awesome name. We had a concept of always wear, having everybody wear a different hat, but we never really followed through on it, except for maybe a couple shows. <laughs> and uh, just you know, from there, we didn't really have too much of a shift until I think in 2013, Hugh joined the band after uh, one of our other Trump players left. And uh, yeah. it's sort of been the crew we've been rocking with ever since. It got the bill last year when... Uh, we had a pretty big, you know, turnover when our guitarist, bassist, and drummer all left in short order. Um, just it was it was time. We we had been going for a long time. People, you know, they're people that advanced in their careers and were at different points in their lives when we started. And it was just it was time for some people to move on. That's what happens, I guess. You know. I always find it admirable when a band can still survive even if they've had lineup changes. How easy is it for you guys to, you know, maintain as a seven piece, you know, how often do you rehearse and what is it like trying to organize seven people to be in a band? <laughs> like herding cats. Yeah, there it is. Drunk yeah. and grumpy cats. Herding kitties? Um, yeah, it, it, it's very hard. I mean, we've fallen into a team where we all have one or two days a week we could mostly do. But, you know, we just, it came to a point where we sort of had to, you know, sort of set in stone, like, these are the days we're doing, because everyone else is just so busy with all the other stuff they got going on. But we've been lucky. You know, we, we've found a crew of great people, and, you know, we, we tried out a few, and a few were really promising and just couldn't commit to it. We tried out some more, and they were just, you know, not quite at the level we needed them to be at. Um, I don't know, just, we, we picked up, and we kept moving forward, and it's, I, don't know, I think it's what's called. Uh, we played. We've been gearing up to the point now where I think we're going to try and uh, advance and leave our own stamp on the event for where we are now. Like, we haven't put out a record in a couple of years, and that's I think the next project we're going to work on after like, these holiday shows are are finished. Yeah, we do actually miss the practice about once a week. Somehow, wow. that's yes. <laughs> weekly. That's great. Um, I know that you guys do have upcoming shows. Can you kind of give us a history 
Are you, you know, playing out more? Have you ever done a tour? Um, give us some background on to how frequently you all play out. Well, uh, we try and play out, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to play out three, four times a month. Hasn't been that as of late. Um, and part of that is just growing pains, um, not being sure that we have a drummer uh, over the summer, you know, after, or after the summer, sort of, you know, led me to, to slow down and not really book a lot for the fall. And my drummer is in five bands already. This is true. <laughs> I had seen those posts. Um, did that person stay with you? Yeah, no, it, we were Pat was a, you know, Pat's been a good friend of ours for a number of years. She used to be one of our subs, you know, back when the band was first starting out. Oh, excuse me. Um, and, and briefly played with Spider Nick. That's true. Um, but she was, a, you know, she's a teacher, and I, after having a number of teachers in the band, I kind of was worried that, you know, things may get a little too busy for any teacher comes to school, come, you know, when the school year kicked in. But you know, Kat had such a good time. She said she would stick. She would stick around, and we were we're very grateful for that. She's a great drummer. Awesome. So I'm very curious. What is the scene like in New York? Because you know, my history and getting into ska. One of the first bands I fell in love with was the Toasters, and they kind of were mm -hmm. influential and instrumental in creating ska on the East Coast with moon ska and bringing that scene to that community what are things like now well um you were spread out a little bit here you know in the band i mean i'd say uh what's called the guys in long island q and paul could probably give you a better read about what's going on on long island right now than i could um but i mean long island's sort of been the same as it's been since you know i guess the early 2000s or mid 2000s where it's a little quieter than it was in the 90s. Um, New York City has got a lot going on. Um, in terms of the toasters, I know that Buck's been, you know, running around as he, as he always does, touring the world, which is great. You know, he's sort of the world ambassador for Scott music, which is or not the only one, but you know, one of the bigger ones, because the toasters have been around since the early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, New York City is always kind of a, an epicenter for, uh, I'd say, more traditional Scott, you know, Stuff that sort of falls into, um, say, New York Scout Orchestra, Scatolites. You know, you have a lot of great bands from New York City. It's got a you know, great rock steady and reggae scene. Um, you have the guys from the Slackers involved in a bunch of other projects, like the Retailer and the Rock Steady 7, Crazy Bald Head. Um, bands from Jersey, like the Trip Up. Sorry? I said they're do one of the guys <laughs> from uh, the Slackers. Um, has been lending his musical abilities to a project in Chicago called the Charlie Taylor All Stars. Oh, nice! Huh. On point tonight. And you can watch that if you go back a couple weeks because we were interviewing them. <laughs> so I digress, but that's a true statement. If you don't believe me, it is recorded. So, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it is. You remember offhand who it was? Was it uh, Agent J? Oh, God damn. I don't remember. Why don't I remember? I don't because he was know what that means. kind of mumbling. I apologize. I don't remember. I just know that they kept saying, they kept kind of going, Ooh, the slackers, they're helping. And I was like, okay. But I know that, you know, even the slackers, Vic helps with the royal architects. So, I mean, it would okay. seem like that grounded area like New York is kind of still a hub of trying to put lots of stuff out all over the place. Yeah, there's a whole, it's weird. In New York City, there's like this cadre of uh, musicians in the ska scene. And a lot of them, you know, centered around like the, the slackers, you know, you have guys like Dave Pugger and Agent J and Vic Ruggiero, and even like guys like Buford L. Sullivan, and they play in a bunch of different bands together. And every time they do, it sounds great. <laughs> no matter what, no matter what project it's for or what it is, um, those guys and the slackers are some of the hardest working uh, guys I know in terms of uh, the Scott, Scott scene. Um, we're actually playing with them on December twenty second in Irving Plaza for their holiday show. Um, we're really excited about that one. They're playing in Chicago mm -hmm. tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday, and they're doing a full album each night. Oh wow. <laughs> so yeah, I heard about those shows. Um, 
my buddy yeah, tried to get involved. Chicago too. That was like when we were on tour. That was one of the shows that fell through. Ah. Yeah, back in the yeah, ironic tour to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you guys have been on tour then, yes? A couple times, yeah. Like, I mean, we we try and do. One of our big projects for the next couple of years is going to be doing more like weekend trips, like doing uh, Rochester, going to Boston, uh, Maine, DC. There's places you can hit on a weekend, like do Friday, Saturday, drive back Sunday. That's going to be our big thing. But I want Europe to do another, you know, week and a half, two week tour this coming yeah. summer. But we'll see if it happens. I think, like, the we, furthest we went out was Louisville, Kentucky. Is that the furthest? Well, that was the first tour we sort of made a loop. We were planning to go to Chicago, and then we just kind of, when the Chicago date fell through, we ended up rebooking the date in Louisville, Kentucky, which was one of the scarier shows that I remember playing. Uh, <laughs> sort of like on the wrong side. Literally uh, just on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, like Yeah, you just rolled in, and it was just a beautiful, shiny metropolis with like... Oh. They were so statues of naked guys, and then you went you went over a track, and it was just absolute like Hoover build and slums and. That's how <laughs> Memphis is set like up that? too. <laughs> At this point, I should mention Chris Quintero dropped again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh uh, I'm sorry, Q. <laughs> if you're out there. So. I'll have to catch up. I'm sorry, I guess. That's okay. Um, you know I'm. I was just thinking as you were talking about some of the points uh, that you want to hit, um, you know, Buffalo has a pretty good ska punk scene, and that's right there, real close to over the border where the classy Rex in Ontario are. So, have you guys thought about doing an international <laughs> tour at some point and jumping the border into Canada to do some of their ska festivals? Yeah, actually. That's <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, always sort of been a goal of mine to be able to do stuff like that. Um, I've been in touch with the uh, people from the Montreal Ska Festival over the years. Um, Daniel from the Classy Rex and I collaborate on another project together, a group called Touring Ska Bands, which is a resource mm -hmm. for you know, independent ska bands looking to book their own tours. Um, he actually helped me put together the format, the roster that we use now, which has uh, some 200 active ska bands on it. Awesome. Um, actually, we'll do for an update soon. But the, the whole concept is the idea that you know, if you don't know where to go to find shows and you're booking your own tour, there's at least a loose network in place now that'll give you a few leads to start with, like people you can reach out to and try and uh, connect with to try and find your band to show if you don't know where to go. Um, so yeah, Canada's always been something that's been on my mind. Um, Central America and Mexico are another spot I'd love to hit. Europe, Japan. Europe and Japan are like, kind of like the holy grail of like where we want to go. We want to. Well, there. everybody who told us tells me Germany is like one of the best places to hit, and I've been dying to get there forever. Australia, a lot of squats. <laughs> Australia too. You want to okay, go to Australia? Australia? Oh, what a plane ride. Right? Hmm? Mm. That I mean, Australia to me is just, though it looks beautiful, I don't know, it's full of poison and scary things that can kill you. All of them. <laughs> so basically, it's just Florida, but bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I would rather go to Australia than Florida. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Florida scares me. Yeah, a little bit. Florida's full of old, yeah, but dying To my knowledge, there's no Australian man. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, how how easy is it to book shows in New York? Because we've talked to bands now all over the place, and certain places are hubs and it's easy to get in, but other places are fairly pretentious, and you really have to like sow your oats and make sure that you have a strong following in order to get booked anywhere. So what's it like trying to book shows in New York? Well, uh, as the person who handles the booking, this, I guess, falls to me. Um, I, I'd say there's definitely some truth to that. A lot of it's about who you know. Uh, and, I mean, it's kind of like looking at it this way. I mean, if you want to play some of these bigger shows, you really kind of have to, you know, get your foot in the door somehow. Um, music in general isn't always a meritocracy. Like, you don't have, you know, you don't necessarily award the most uh, uh, prestigious and, and uh, best talented bands 
you know, with the spots on all the bigger shows sometimes. Sometimes it's really just who you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, you, you, we put our best foot out there. We always do our best to try and promote. And, you know, we've been, I've been doing this long enough, just not even just the pandemics, but between my time and uh, Bigger Thomas, Rudy Crew, Spider Nick. Um, I've been doing this long enough that I know a lot of the people that put together these events. And more often than not, you know, it's just about, you know, maybe a well-timed email to the right person at the right time. And just trying to keep a positive attitude. Um, I would say for bands traveling into New York City, um, yeah, it's tough. There are always places you can play, though. If you're looking for uh, a good bill to sit on or just a show on an off night or something like that, there are places that are willing to put you up, put you uh, on stage. If, if not, you know, pay you a uh, fair wage for a touring band, but you got to fill a Tuesday night with something on tour, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we actually, uh, I started a label about a year ago called Lonely Adam Records, and we, up until very recently, we were booking showcases like once a month for, you know, New York City bands, bands on tour, and, you know, not just ska bands either, just, you know, we did anything under the sun that we liked. Um, Hip-hop, folk punk, um, rock and roll, ska, reggae, you know, anything that, that's the way we, we could do, because there's a lot of overlap in these scenes, too. It's not like... You're only going to see, you know, ska bands playing with ska bands, but sometimes you'll have ska bands playing with hip hop bands. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul is in a band called Love Is a Fist, which is a yes. ska. I hip -hop we've played them. Yeah. We've played them on our show. Oh, nice. Thank you. That, that features. Uh, uh, point that we've lost a lot of good venues in recent years too. That yeah, that seems right to be a growing bar. epidemic. Why are you guys losing venues? It's a pandemic. It's a pandemic. Hank the Loon is about to go. I think, I think rent is definitely part of it. Yeah. I mean, Education. the way that, you know, the things have been going over the last 20, 30, hell, even like 35 years at this point, as, uh, as areas get gentrified, the rents go up, so people move further and further out. Like, I really and village moved to Williamsburg, and then after they got pressed out of Williamsburg, they moved to Bushwick. And so the cycle continues. And even places that can afford their rent, they get uh, they get uh, hipsters and millennials, uh, not millennials, uh, yuppies moving in. That makes like noise complaints until the cops shut them down. That's always my favorite. Oh yeah, they move to the places because they want the culture, and then they complain about the noise that is the culture. Yes, <laughs> I'm gonna move to the city that never sleeps, but I want to go to bed at 10 p.m. on a Friday night. You moved to the wrong goddamn city, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, we played, used to play this place called The Swamp, which is sort of like an in-the-know kind of place. They didn't really advertise their address. But in the five years we, used to, we were playing there, when they moved in, they were the only thing on the block. They were like across the street from, like, a rock quarry. And by the time they closed, they had, like, two art galleries that had opened up next to them. And there was a restaurant down, like, a high-end, or not a high-end, but a medium-end restaurant down the street. And you just <laughs> tell the neighborhood was changing and... They weren't going to put up with, you know, DJ parties until 4 a.m. anymore. And if there's still, like, a freaking, uh, what is it, like, a granite or, like, marble grinding equipment uh, right across the street. It's still industrial. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I, guess, I guess some people will call that character. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's quiet, it's okay. We don't want any of you weirdos making noise too late and upsetting anybody. <laughs> Exactly. So long as it's not during the hours of nine to five, I guess, yeah. So or after the hours of nine to five. Where do you, where do you guys fit in as far as <coughs> the spectrum of ska? Okay. Um, well, I like to think we do a little bit of everything. Um, when I said I to start, you know, start the band, I wanted to do something that was, you know, a little different than what I've been doing. Like I've been playing with bands like. Conrad back these three, Bigger Thomas, Spider Nick, and the Rudy Crew for a long time. So I've done a lot of traditional ska and like, you know, basically like a second wave uh, revival or, you know, maybe even like third wave revival ska. And um, I wanted to do something with a bit more of an edge, like the stuff that I grew up listening to, uh, ska punk kind of stuff. So when I first started out, you know, being uh, the pretentious, inexperienced band leader I was, I gave, you know, a bunch of people three records to listen to. Before I realized how pretentious that was, I said, if you can get down with us, you can get down with us, which was really silly considering, you know, we had nothing 
going first at the time. So what you're saying is um, nobody can book with you unless they listen? No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those three records were you know, the, the source I wanted to draw on as you know an example of what I wanted to do. They were uh, London Calling by The Clash, um, Full Tension Beaters by Tokyo Sky Pirates Orchestra, mm -hmm. and uh, Shed Some Skin by Slow Gherkin. Ah. So very different kind of kinds of bands and I was really looking for a really diverse sound. And that's always sort of been, you know, something I appreciate in different bands. Bands that can do more than one thing and do it well and just sort of take a subgenre or take a feel of a song and make it their own. Um, and I think that for me that that in, in my opinion that's something I've always striked and it's something I think we do pretty well. So, having a four to five piece horn section helps. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to go back um, a titch, when we started this, you were talking about how you had, you know, just slight turnover. With the turnover, just curious, has it been easier to maintain a horn section? <coughs> or, you know, with the people that you've had to replace in your lineup, um, you know, what instruments have you lost and had to replace? Is there one that seems to go more frequently than another? Well, if we're going... Like to Final Pass, I think we kill drummers the most. <laughs> <laughs> why is yeah. that a thing? I mean, why, why, are, why is the death of the drummer the thing? It seems like drummers are super hard to find. Because they're and a they pain don't in the stay ass. around. <laughs> Uh, I, I will say that we've loved every drummer that we've had. You know, we've, we've never had to remove anybody. Um, they've all left of their own accord, which is which is great. Um, that said, you know what Paul said before is uh, very true. All of them were in like five bands at once. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and it makes trying to coordinate. You know, we, we already have the, the deck stacked against us. We've got seven people. So having one person who is the big literal timing belt of the whole machine here always busy makes it impossible to book gigs around and um, I, I'll say right now the way that we have everything set up the crew we have you know is working like clockwork and it's great um, but I think just in general drummers are in such high demand good, well, good drummers are in such high demand because you know the, what's what you really uh, I think what's what the responsibilities are a little lighter in some regards I mean there are certainly drummers who write music and or integral parts of bands, but there are also plenty of drummers out there who, like our former drummer, Jake, the guy who left about a year, year and a half ago, you know, he's a session drummer, he works as a drummer in a wedding band, which is part of his day gig, um, and he does, like, he's a professional musician, that's, that's, what he, that's what he does, that's what he wants to do, and there's a lot more call, I think, for professional drummers that can fit into pretty much any situation, as opposed to, you know, a professional trombonist, which is kind of locked into playing ska, calypso, salsa, you know, something with a horn section. <laughs> so that would be my estimation on why uh, why we keep burning to drummers. Because a lot of people, you know, they're out there looking to have fun. I mean, uh, we do pretty well, I think, for what we managed to handle. But it's uh, it can definitely be tough to find the drummer to the right style, especially since we play so many different, you know, different styles of music and different styles of ska music. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty specific toolkit. Um. You, you had mentioned something during your answer that makes me want to ask you all the next question. So when you are practicing and playing and creating your music, do you have a sole driving force, um, Mr. Pretentious, who is responsible for all of the music writing? <laughs> or, or do all of you collaborate in such a way where someone says, oh, I came up with this today, and then the guitarist is like, oh, I can fit into that part. Or, you know, how does your music come to be? How is it created? Too many notes, Malone. Too many notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer part of this, and I'll leave the rest to Paul, because I feel like Paul's getting left out of the discussion a little bit. But, um, you know, we, we've done this a bunch of different ways. <laughs> we've done this a bunch of different ways over the years. Like, uh, our former guitarist used to come in with charts prearranged for everyone to play at rehearsal which was always kind of jarring to me because I had never done it that way. Oh, Brian was crazy. He would just like arrange stuff for like, you know, full orchestras, like in a single night just for fun. <laughs> yeah. 
So, I mean, it, it, it got us up to speed very quickly because we had a bunch of people that were classically trained. And um, it, it, was, it definitely changed the feel of the band from what it originally had been before he came in, came on board. And, you know, I'm always going to be grateful to him for doing that because I think it made us better players as well, being able to play as a section and read charts. And the say for a gig, if we were doing a cover gig, we could learn, you know, if he, if he showed up with charts, we could learn all the songs in a couple of weeks and be ready to do like a three hour set. But from my perspective, I always try to encourage people to contribute where they can. And, you know, some people just don't contribute as much as others, and that's okay. Um, but the majority of stuff is, you know, like you said, I'll bring in an idea and we'll toss it around to the guitar, bass, and drums. The horns will chime in and add their two things, and the songs kind of come together organically in that regard. Um, that said, in, in my opinion, everyone's always welcome to bring ideas. Always encouraged, and uh, yeah, we just try and feel uh, things out as we go. Yeah, I feel like the newest songs have been more collaborative, mm -hmm. but uh, the like oh. one of our older songs that actually was like fully organic, everybody in the band pretty much was involved. Was uh, I don't know if we actually have a recording of it, Rue Valentine. We do, uh, it, it's not released, it's a it's, I don't know if it's going to be released the way it is now. It was, uh, I think we may be re re recording that when we go into the studio. But I, well, we do have, but yeah, that way I was written uh, collaboratively. Yeah, yeah. With Brian and the band, which is, you know, shocking. But yeah. So you sent me three albums and then mm -hmm. another, I think, just one song. So tell me about what it is that you sent me, because you sent me Patient Zero, Headcase, right? And then uh, one, your, one of your most recent, which I apologize, I cannot remember off the top of my head, but I know that I have all three of them. <laughs> so tell me about okay. the music that um, you sent us. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Spider Nick was the tenor player on Patient Zero, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that was the one recording I was not on. It was an entirely different band except for myself and James. Um, and we wrote, we recorded that back in you know, actually like Nick's house, which brought a couple microphones. Spider Nick had a small studio set up at his house, um, very DIY. We recorded everything there like, a couple, over a period of a couple weekends. That was the first EP in, I want to say, 2011. Yep, it said uh, Viva was our engineer. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's also something else real. The other, one of the other bands I was playing with at the time was band uh, Kenny Petura. Um, so like a uh, Scott Klesmer, Gypsy, uh, World Indie is I guess how I would describe them. A little bit of a Latin feel. And uh, they actually just broke up, unfortunately, but they were together for about nine, eight, nine years. Um, they were the band that brought me to Japan. I went to go with them in like, the end of 2010, early 2011. So, uh, but yeah, Dima and I were working together on that project, and he engineered that record for us. Um, that was a, it went from being, what's called a, I think it ended up being a four song or five song EP. And the next year, we put out our first, and to this point, only full length called Brain on Tap. Um, that is, you had that one. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, I think maybe three years ago, three and a half years ago at this point. Uh, we put out Hard Headed, which was our last EP. Um, we did that one at Spella Studios with our old bass player, Will, as the engineer. Um, and the single song I sent you, uh, Killing Time, was from the Lonely Adam Records Radical Chemical series. We actually pressed that one on uh, translucent red 7-inch vinyl. And that's actually a split single with our friends in circles. There was a song called Heavy Hitter on there, too. Awesome. So, how DIY are you, folk? Oh, boy. When you say DIY, what do you mean DIY? Okay. <laughs> I mean, you talk, but no, but, but what, what, what regard? Uh, well, that's... Don't free print your own shirts, but <laughs> that, otherwise... Like, you know, have, have, have things changed as far no. as recording? Like, you said you started in a basement and now have moved to a studio. When you guys release music, are you using a distributor? Are you going through your own, you know, record label? Um, are you working collaboratively with local artists to do your merchandise and art? Those sorts of things. Like, how in-house are you? Or are you paying people to do a whole bunch of other stuff for you? 
Well, I think at different stages of the game, we've definitely employed all of those things. Um, um, for an example, um, the patient zero AP, the cover and layout were done by our uh, former bassist Greg, um, and fr friends helped record it. It was done on a shoestring budget, and we made when we, when we made when we made those. I actually went out and bought a printer that can print on CDs, and we I had to I had to burn each individual one, print it out, and we assembled the CDs from like. People getting rid of jewel cases on Craigslist. I'd drive to people's houses and pick up garbage bags full of jewel cases, and we'd like spend the drives to gigs assembling these things in the van or in the car on the way to the gig. Um, we made about 300 of those, or, three, or maybe 400 of those, before the printer finally died and they said, "All right, it's enough for this." And the next one, we uh, we paid to have done. Um, but even in the studio, like our last record, Hard Headed, even Killing Time. Our bassist Will was the engineer. He lives. He actually lives at Sabella Studios. He's one of the in-house resident engineers there. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've always tried to incorporate where we can. You know, the skills of our members. Um, in terms of artwork, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of really crazy, talented friends. Um, a few here in New York. A few in other places. Um, uh, the person who did the uh, the brain on tap artwork, I don't know if you remember the uh, the web comic Twenty One Dead Monkeys. It's like a ska web comic. Yeah. From like maybe that was uh, my friend Boston who drew that uh, comic strip. She did that artwork for us for that. Um, and we we're working with this guy now. Um, ben Hyten did a, the design for our brand new T-shirts, which hopefully we'll be getting in the next couple weeks. We've got a place in order like tomorrow for those. Um, He's done a lot of stuff. He did our uh, our flyer for our winter show run that we're doing over the next month or so. He reached out to me and to ask specifics so that he could finish that flyer. Oh, nice. He's very thorough then, I guess. Yes, he's, he's really I was impressed. I have applauded him for actually oh. doing like research and making sure that he had all the info. Due diligence. Mm -hmm. That is um, a rare so find in a human. <laughs> It's very true. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Kate Perry is another friend of mine who's, been, who's done a lot of graphic design work for us in terms of show flyers. And like her job is she actually does fashion design for, like she makes like custom costumes for people on Halloween and other various things around the city. It's like her day job. And like the flyers are just sort of a fun thing she does on the side for us. And we're actually talking about doing a music video with her at some point. Uh, and having her design the costumes for it should be really cool. But uh, hopefully we're going to get circled back to that in the springtime after we're in the studio for the next record. So, so when I you, hope that answers that question. Yes. <laughs> when you search, you guys, um, on your band camp, you have like a cute little, I think it is a purple <coughs> snake with like the little fedora and stuff. Who did that? Holy uh, uh, well, the, the, that's, it's actually a germ. <laughs> Did you say it's a, a germ? A germ? Yep. He looks like a snake. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I mean, uh, yeah, we have we have actually have a couple different versions of that logo. This is guy Michael Anderson who put it together. Our old bass player Greg found him on I think Deviant Art or something like that, and um, he approached him by doing a logo and. You know, it came out great. We wanted him to do more stuff, but then Greg said he just lost contact with him. He kept emailing. He never wrote back. So Ugh. ended up being like a one-off or a two-off, I guess. <laughs> that's the one that gets chased away by furries. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's, that's a different artist and a different story for a different time. <laughs> uh, I would imagine that's a common problem for DV stars, though. Chased away by furries, pissing off the furries, and then having to change your name. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a story for another time, I think. <laughs> when you guys decide to come do this live. Ah, yeah. see what I did there? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I, I do. You guys based on the yeah, on the yeah, right? I like if you wanted to come this way and like do Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin and like, I don't know, Missouri, and then make your way into Oklahoma. Like we know people all that way that you could like chart that. Tour. Oh, that'd be a cool thing to do. Uh, where we can only ironically do Chicago. 
Yeah, I yeah. mean, like, <laughs> you could do Chicago. Where were you supposed to play in Chicago that that fell through? Oh, man. Um, I don't even remember. It was, it was a long time ago. Um, it was like, I want to say it was MP shows or something like that. Put the show together. It was some sort of local booking collective. And it's actually kind of a funny, well, it's a funny story now how it got canceled. But like leading up to the tour, we were really stressed trying to make sure everything was ready to go. The new record was ready to go. It was bring on tap at the time. And I sent out an email to advance the show to get all the details of load in time, backline information and whatnot. And they sent an email back, is everyone in your band over 21? And at the time, our drummer was like 20. And he was turning 21 the day after the show, or two days after the show. And I said, well, no, just to let you know, he'll be 21 like two days after the show. And they canceled the whole show on us. Wow. Which really stunned. Which yeah. was a pisser for me, because I'm the old man of the group. And back when I first started playing, I was 20. You just walk into a bar, even in New York City, if you had an instrument in your hand, they waved you through and put a beer in your hands. Nobody ever asked. Thank you, my day. Where is not known for being... Anyway, I'm going to drop that. No, no, no. <laughs> we, we admire free speech here, so go on with your thought. Oh, I didn't think Chicago was known for being that, like, uh, you know, stringent. Bougie. Uh, I, th I, I I feel like Chicago has become a very guarded, pretentious scene, and it has become a okay. very hard place to play, and I would say to <clears throat> grow. Um, you know, there's a few bands that have rock solid footing there, and they play. Um, but if you have, you know, a new up and comer, even if they're in the city, they're, they're calling us and they're saying, where do I play? And I'm like, you fucking live in Chicago. How are you not connected oh, wow. to these people? So there's a lot of silos and disconnects within even the musical community. And I feel like that, yeah. that is almost like a sickness of the Midwest. Um, there seems, there seems to be in the Midwest at least that, you play, and there's only a few venues that play, and these are the same bands that play, and new or upcoming bands, if you don't know how to network or are just trying to cut your teeth, you have to reach out and find somebody who is connected to everything to be able to say, you need to call these people. And then it usually even takes like that connection between us throwing somebody into a group message and like <coughs> making them responsible to respond. Yeah, vetting them. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's sort of similar everywhere to to a certain degree, and I think that's a big fall. Of, I'm gonna get into a large philosophical discussion here, <laughs> but I think it's a big fail with uh, the Scott scene in general is that, or even music scenes in general is that you have to look at to the next generation and really kind of give opportunities to younger bands as they come up. Right. Because if not, this ends with us. And I will say, just for my own part, I played in Chicago twice over the last year and a half or so. You know, I've, I've been playing with Pilfers on and off for the last two years, two and a half years. Yes. And, you know, most shows I've played up at Reggie's have been really fun. The crowds have been good. The bands have been good. Um, there's some cool bands out in Chicago, like uh, the Jacob Horn Trio is really good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm blanking on the names of the other two or three bands that was the last time I was out there. Um, but the shows out there have been pretty cool. I wish I'd, I'd seen a little bit more of the city than just Reggie's, but... Uh, Fortunately, when you're on tour, you don't always have the liberty to go exploring. I guess it's not vacation, it's tour. Right. <laughs> this is your but, job. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. But I mean, it's, I think, you know, for, I think you're going to find that anywhere. It's, it's kind of daunting, especially in New York City. It, it's sort of like, if you want to go out and paint a masterpiece, um, but you just hand a blank canvas, where do you start? Uh, so even if you have the opportunities laid out in front of you, now, what path is the right path? I can't tell you. I think it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, if you can find your way, you, I think a lot of people sort of get caught up in the idea that, you know, you need to do all sorts of things and, you know, you got to, what's called schmooze and find your food. Yeah, there's some of it out there that you have to do, but the most important thing is to really, you know, hone your craft. It's really, you know, to build up your performance to the point where people want to see you. Mm -hmm. You start doing that right, you know, the rest kind of falls into place to some degree. I mean, it still takes work, but it's a lot easier if you got a band that's, you know, that people want to see, as opposed to just sort of trying to 
push yourself into create situations without that. So it's kind of like putting the cart before the horse, if that makes any sense. Yes, you do have to kind of, you just have to have the opportunity to be able to grow. And I feel like that has to come from partnering with other bands that are established. So as long as all of us older folk maintain the mentality that we want to continue to have music as a oh. thing, then it's almost like being a, we have to be band parents. We have to watch our little <laughs> seedlings grow. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, no, the wackles are my heart at those. <laughs> Do you, <laughs> So we are reaching the top of the hour and I want to cover a few more things before we are finished with you folk. What are your upcoming plans and goals? This is this is plug time. So tell us about your upcoming tour that you have for the winter and then your plans for the studio. When can people see that release? And uh, then we'll talk about where they can find you on the interwebs. Okay, I think I'll, start, I'll try and just zip right through this then real quick. Um, yeah. So we've got another three gigs before the end of the year. Um, we're making our long-awaited return to New Jersey on December 8th at the Harp and Bard with our good friends in Disposable, Fat Chance, and uh, a New Jersey ska super group called... Wait, 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 wait. We, we, we were long-awaited to return to Jersey? <laughs> Well, <laughs> certain parts of Jersey. Again, a sort a soul for another day. We don't like the San Jose house. Just leave it at that. Oh, oh well, yeah, yeah. Um, but only happy news here. We're playing at the Hartford Bar in Clifton, New Jersey, on December eighth. It's gonna be a good show. It's been a while since we've seen our Jersey family. Can't wait. Um, after that, we're playing the Slackers Holiday Show at Irving Plaza, New York City, on December twenty second, with uh, DJ Gracious Fades, War on Women, and of course the Slackers. And then on December 27th to Thursday, um, we're doing this event called the Hometown Fowdown up in Alston, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. Um, it's sold out already, so if you have tickets, we'll see you there. Um, it's like a pre-party for the Mighty Mighty Boston's Hometown Throwdown series that we're doing at the House of Blues. That's awesome. <laughs> and that's so with... Uh, Grace of Spades was regular at the Swamp. She was. And she's, yeah. uh, she's, she's been around here too for a long time. She's a great DJ. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Throwdown features uh, Toxic Totes, which is a Boston tribute band from Chicago. Yep. Believe it or not, ska bands can have those too. <laughs> yes. Um, Sergeant, Sergeant Scadnetti from Connecticut and our uh, good friend Sonic Lodito from up in Maine. And it's sold out. We, we haven't played in Boston in forever, so it's going to be great to go back up there and see all our friends up there. Not to mention, I've been talking with Pandemic up to all my friends in the 737, which is like a Boston super fan group that goes to the third end of the year from like all over the world. So, just why are we going to Boston in December? Boston. As long as I don't have to drive, I don't care. It'll be good, I promise. <laughs> and uh, after that, you know, we're booking out for, for next year right now, but uh, nothing's really confirmed yet after. A show in December. We have a few things on the horizon, like we're looking at Rochester in April. Um, a couple other things are batting around, uh, you know, the mid-Atlantic region on the East Coast in the spring. And um, we just got so many songs that haven't been recorded yet that we're going to try and fashion into a new record um, early next year. So like January, February time, I want to kind of have that established. Demos by March, studio by April. You know, again, I say these things as a timeline doesn't mean they'll happen that quickly. Chances are, you know, anything in music, add fifty percent longer than you thought it would take. I and like I that you only gave it fifty percent. But at least by then we'll have four uh, even more songs to record, so maybe this uh, next album will be our Sandinista <laughs> A double record or something like that, yeah. Um, and I, and the plan is right now, unless somebody else wants to pick it up, put it out when we had records and uh, distribute it ourselves and just through our network of uh, folks out there that we, uh, we deal with. And uh, those are our plans thus far. I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll get a, we'll an email from somebody in Japan who really wants to bring us over there and put out our record. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But uh, until then, we're just going to keep pushing forward. So some, do you have an 
estimated time as to when people could expect to see new album from you? When do you want that album? Ideally, if we get everything done, I'd love to have it out this summer. And we'd love to put it together a tour to support it, maybe through the Midwest. <laughs> um, so that, that's, the, that's the goal anyway. And that, you know, it's a, it was close. If we get up, added those things, it would be great. Look at, we'd love to put together something to anchor a tour around. So they still do the, uh, the Scappleton or Appleton Scott Festival. Oh my out there, God! Ha ha! You're funny! Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I tell people about Scaffolton, they're like, what? And only very few know. So kudos to you. Uh, Scaffolton <laughs> did die a few years ago. And then in 2015, it was rejuvenated only to thus again go die. by the wayside. Um, they lost uh, Lawrence University as like that founding place where it always happened. Um, and then it just kind of mm -hmm. seemed that uh, it seems like Scott died over here for some reason. Like, for a minute. I can only oh. name a few Wisconsin ska bands, to be honest, because it just has kind of gone away. They all became really sad mopey kids. They wanted to play emo. They or emo like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and wear tight sweaters. You know, I just play ska in minor. That still works. <laughs> I, know my friend Rick, I know my friend Rick from My Boy for Photos moved out to Minneapolis not too long ago. <laughs> I was um, going to say that you got the Kodos. Haha, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I actually recorded for them not too long ago, maybe a, year, a couple of years ago. Um, their posthumous record. I, I ended up stubbing for them when they came out to do that second Apple Stomp Festival that kind of, you know, got all weird and had to be up there at the last minute. Uh -huh. So it was like, it was myself, JT from ASOB, and uh, Joe Bogey on bass. Uh, supplementing like a skeleton crew of I voted for Kodos when they came to the East Coast for a show in Manhattan. Wow. Which was kind of fun. And they asked me to do like a song for their next record after that, which was kind of fun. Great. Um, but you guys also have something to do out there. Good friends of ours, or good friends of mine, Brad and Chris, yeah. also ex Kodos people. Yeah. Doing the thing. Um, I'm trying to remember who else in Wisconsin is playing Scott right now, and I really like to jump on their mind. Right? But, uh, Right, so you have yeah. something to do, and you have courtesy of Tim that I can think of off the top of my head. In Wisconsin. Because... He's in another band, too, but that's about it. Um, a lot of our music, I think, has gone by the way of punk, and it's gotten heavy. Mm -hmm. And then in the, I would say, the central part of the state, you have a lot of rock. And, like, you know, like radio rock stuff. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. but Minnes our band stopped made on Long Island. It's horrible. You have what? Yeah, we've been we've been invaded by tribute bands on Long Island. Ah, got that. Everyone, everyone's got a tribute band, and they seem to be pulling in. You know, I guess the, the club owners are happy because you know they bring people down. They just want to get you know yes. tipsy and sing along. And that's the, that is that is killing. I would say original music around here. We have a bunch of people who will support and do giant fests that are all tribute or cover shows. And I'm like, wait a second. Yep. Tribute Island. <laughs> yeah, we have a whole fucking festival now called Tribute Island. It's and they, we have- we, oh, It's awful. Yeah. I just threw up in the mouth a little. You yeah, should. Before, before. Fucking awful. <laughs> and it, it's not like anything good cover wise either. Like two white crew. In sticks, in like journey. Oh wow. Yeah, man. People in Wisconsin just want to like, drink and reminisce about their 1970s football team where they raped the cheerleader and then didn't do anything afterwards. Whatever! That's true! We speak the truth here! Oh, the R word. I believe it. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that the lyrics of a necromantic song? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I believe that, too. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, I just heard about what's called a truth band being added. I'm not sure if it's true, but a cover band being added to the hometown throwdown this year. That kind of threw me for a little I think the one you know switches that the kids, the people involved are all like under the age of fifteen. Yes. And it's a kind of an odd thing. I mean, they, they played Skankin' and Crankin' Fest this year too, which I will I, admit, I want to see many kids. <laughs> <laughs> um. <coughs> so as we have, re I mean, we digressed significantly. Slightly. Um, but 
For those, because we have quite a, a group of humans watching, we've been talking to the pandemics, and if you would real quick let people know how and where can they find you. Okay, so we have a few different places you can go looking for us. Um, we have a website, thepandemics.myc. Bring you to our website for now. It's going to be changing soon. Our, web, our uh, website is going to be going away for a little while or changing platforms. Um, we just started a brand new web store with a pre sale that actually goes through uh, tomorrow midnight uh, with our brand new shirts. They're $12 instead of 15 and they come with a brand new sticker if anyone's interested. Ooh. Um, and that's at thepandemics.bigcartel.com. Um, if you want to check out some of our music, you can stream it over at our Bandcamp page, thepandemics.bandcamp.com. Um, we're also on all the other big social media platforms like Twitter, twitter.com slash the pandemic, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. Just search for the pandemics, look for the germ logo, and uh, that's where we'll be. Oh, and our Facebook page it probably gets the most love of all our social media, so facebook.com slash the pandemics. And if you're in a band and you want to connect and start getting networked around the U.S., Touring Ska Bands is a group on Facebook. Um, I invite you guys, if you come across other bands, because we're non-genre specific, shoot them our way. And as you can see, we're accommodating and do phone interviews. So have people come our way. Absolutely. Have them come our way. We'll direct people your way if we know people that need to get out onto the East Coast. And thus a partnership begins. Um, and knock, knock. Absolutely. And just to touch back to what we were talking about before, I mean, I think that's where, you know, a lot of bands, you know, they're playing stuff, they want it to grow, that's where you have to go. I think you have to kind of have to sort of get over the idea of just playing ska shows and just playing shows in general, I think is the way to do that. So if you have a show with a punk band, a rock band, and a ska band, you have a pretty good show right there, I think, if you're, you know, if you're inclined to, to put it together. To do I agree. Things. I digress. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, you guys, for coming on our our show, doing a phone interview with us. Thanks for having us. And I hope yeah, to meet you someday in, in real life. <laughs> I are. I are. You what? Well, well, uh, I'll I'll definitely see you at the next supernova when that happens in 2020. I don't know uh, who will be there with or what's going to be going on. I hope we'll get on to it. Hi, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tim. But, uh, if you need an MC or host, you should have us come do it live. We'll, we'll do Supernova oh, Scott yeah. Fest live. Put bugs in people's ears. We should do that. That would That's a goal of mine. Yeah. Well, we're ready to start the writing the letter writing campaign. I'm definitely going to hold you to that. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> we did one fest this past summer in Milwaukee. So, <coughs> so yes, I want, yeah. I want to do that. And there's Ska by Ska West coming up in april on the 19th and 20th in austin oh balance right well austin okay yeah so somebody somebody hits up about that i gotta see if we can swing just because it's, it's kind of far for, for us in, um, in april during the school year right just uh, so. mark from madeline is the coordinator of that event mm -hmm. so madeline actually features um our good friend i think uh Samson Fletchbomb on trombone. He used to play in a band called Eli Whitney and the Sound Machine. Mm -hmm. We used to put together with a lot. Like he made for a long time with a different all the time. Those guys are great. Well, I thank you very much, and we're going to take a short break. And when we return, we're going to play your music so you guys can relax. And if you tune back in in just a few minutes, we'll be playing your stuff. Ooh, awesome. Thank you guys Please. so much. Thank you. Kay? Thank you. Thanks.